First of all, thanks for showing up. Um, there's such a wealth of choice out there, we weren't sure anybody would turn up for this, so thank you. Um, we have uh, something planned for you today that is sort of a work in progress for us. We're going to share some research that the three of us have been working on for some time and that we're actually beginning to test out at Carnegie Mellon. So we're really excited to share it with you today, but I think the emphasis would be on its work in progress. So it's actually opening up uh, an invitation to interact with, with the idea. I'm Terry Irwin, I'm the head of the School of Design at Carnegie Mellon, and I'm being joined by my fellow faculty member, Cameron Tonkinwise, who is the director of uh, design studies and our doctoral program, and Dr. Gideon Kossoff, who is a uh, social ecologist and design theorist. Come on in. Excellent. So we're going to talk to you today about what we are calling transition design. And we are saying that it's design-led societal transition towards a more sustainable future. And by transition design, we don't mean that designers are going to be redesigning every facet of society, but we mean that people are going to be working in a space that we're calling transition design to help society transition toward a more sustainable future. And we believe that designers have a really key role to play in that. So the, the transition to a sustainable society is arguably the most important challenge of the 21st century. And we think we can really contribute to that. So I just wanted to touch for a moment on how much I think ch things have changed in the past 10 years. I actually programmed the National AIGA conference in Vancouver 10 years ago. Was anybody there by any chance? That, that was a great experience for me. It was a real honor, but it was, I think, the first time that we'd really tried to mainline a lot of sustainable, sustainability into the conference. And I would say it was received with mixed reviews. <laughs> some people loved it, some people hated it. Um, but I think just within our own organization, things have changed a lot in the past 10 years. Some of you were probably at Pivot two years ago, and we saw that all of a sudden more and more um, sessions on design for social impact, the living, the, the living principles got introduced, and finally if you go to the national website, you see design for good. So I think that that's a real sign of change. I wouldn't have predicted that level of, of change in 10 years. You can look around at most of the leading um, design program, education programs, and if you're not on there, I really am sorry, I just grabbed a bunch. And almost everyone is looking at design for sustainability or social impact to some extent. The other really important thing is that for the first time we are connected on a global scale in ways that we were not 10 years ago. So in a way, we think that we're at a unique and ideal point to set longer, a longer term course that can help connect and amplify efforts in the short term and inform them for the long term. So, Think of it in a way as charting a course to a faraway destination. Before we made it to the moon, we had to have a vision of going there, and we had to actually decide to do it. We had to muster the knowledge and the technology to do it and, and get a design a process to get ourselves there. But there's another important piece. We actually had to train people that would be able to make the journey, both physically and psychologically. So planning a journey of any kind like this is kind of like the flight to the moon, and it's simple in one regard. You have to decide, well, we want to get from point A to point B. But the process is not that simple. As any rocket scientist will tell you, the flight to the moon was much more like this. It was a constant process of course correction. It was a constant process of comparing where you, had, you were and how you might have drifted to where you wanted to go. So going through that kind of process 
we are proposing takes a certain kind of body to do that, and it takes a certain kind of knowledge in order to be in transition. So think of this as a metaphor for our current unsustainable state and the flight to the moon as the aspiration of transitioning to a sustainable society. So transition design asks several questions. Where do we want to go? And what will it be like when we get there? What knowledge, skill sets, and value shifts are necessary in order to make that transition? So we could also think of transition as a continuum along which transition designers will work. And we believe that work all along that continuum will be needed. So the initiatives that we've seen within the AIGA are being mirrored mirrored all over the world within multiple disciplines, professions, and other organizations. And Transition Town, the Transition Town Network in the UK is a very good example of an initiative that's gone viral within an entire country. What we propose that we're missing, however, is a long-term vision of where we're headed and a practice, if you like, of developing comp compelling narratives about how to get there and what it would be like when we are there. So the work at either end of this continuum that trans transition designers will, will undertake is at this end amplifying and connecting these myriad of efforts that we're all aware of and that we see popping up everywhere. But it will also be developing narratives and glimpses of what we're calling the not yet, which Gideon will talk more about in a moment. So these narratives, and more importantly, the process of turning our imaginations as designers and our talents to the longer term future can serve as a compass to guide the current everyday, the current um, shorter term efforts. We could also think about it as a magnet that is sort of pulling the current efforts towards a more crystallized future. So currently, our efforts are framed within social and less often environmental concerns in mind. However, they're usually framed with relatively short horizons of time in mind. And I say that within the context of, for instance, think of the Native American peoples who thought seven generations out before they made any decision of significance, and we certainly <laughs> aren't doing that, I don't think. So a larger, longer-term vision of the future can aid in not only helping to connect these myriad, sometimes disparate efforts in a meaningful way, but they ca it can actually influence the solution from their inception. So transition design does several things. It proposes design-led societal change that can be a powerful area for design practice, research, and study. It's based on the formulation of future-oriented, lifestyle-based, and this is the important emphasis, lifestyle-based narratives that can inspire and direct the transition. So in other words, that's the vision piece. It is informed by new knowledge and ideas outside the design disciplines that explain the dynamics of change and how to live and design within it. And I think that one is very exciting. Cameron is gonna go into that more deeply. But how do things change? What are the dynamics of change? How do we initiate it? There are lots of uh, methodologies and theories out there that we feel can be pulled in to inform design process towards that goal. It's based upon a more ecological worldview. Some of you have heard me banging on about that one for years. A different posture and transdisciplinary collaboration. So this is the piece that we think often gets left out. So we're used to designing new processes. We're used to conceiving of, you know, futures maybe, albeit not so long term a future. But do we ever turn it back on ourselves and say, what is the body or what is the posture or mindset that I might have to shift to in order to be in a more fluid transitory state or transitional state? And finally, 
We say that new ways of designing will emerge out of all of the above. So we, we're going to propose a four bubble framework to you today. Um, I'm, I'm going to set it up. Uh, Cameron's going to talk about theories of change. Gideon's going to talk about the vision. And I'm going to close with something about posture. We're not going to go deep into new ways of designing because we thought we'd bring the, the further afield new information to you in this, in this session. So a vision for transition to a sustainable society is needed. It calls for the reconception of entire lifestyles that are human scale, place-based, but globally connected in their exchange of technology, information, and culture. It calls for communities to be in a symbiotic relationship with their ecosystem. Theories of change. Ideas, theories, and methodologies from many varied fields and disciplines inform a deep understanding of the dynamics of change in both the natural and the social worlds. New posture and mindset. Living in and through transitional times requires a mindset and posture of openness, mindfulness, a willingness to collaborate, and what Cameron has called an an optimistic grumpiness. So it's a dissatisfaction with the status quo. It's a sense of urgency to change to a new state. But it's an optimism that believes that we can. New ways of designing. The transition to a sustainable society will require new ways of designing that are characterized by sensitivity to design for initial conditions, place-based, context-based design, even, even more so than we have now. A systems approach in which we are designing for the next level up or down. Network and alliance building. Transdisciplinary and co-design processes. I think design has made amazing strides in that area, but I think we can, we can do more. Understanding of materiality and its role in the built world. Design that amplifies grassroots efforts. And this is part of what Ezio Manzini's uh, Does This Network has looked to do, amplify what's already going on. And then most importantly, a beta error-friendly approach to designing. So there's the framework that we are proposing. We also believe that these bubbles are sort of mutually reinforcing. So between the vision and theories of change, the vision of the transition to a sustainable society will require new knowledge about natural, social, and built systems. But that new knowledge, in turn, will evolve the vision itself. So between theories of change and posture, a new theory of change will reshape our temperaments, mindsets, and postures. New information, in other words. And these new ways of being in the world will motivate a search for even new and more relevant knowledge. So we're talking about a mutually influencing circle here. So between posture and mindset and new ways of designing, changes in our own mindsets and posture will give rise to new ways of designing by default, in a way. As new design approaches evolve, designers' temperaments and postures will continue to change. And then finally, between these new ways of designing and, and the vision, new ways of designing will help realize the vision, but they will also change and evolve it. As the vision evolves, new ways of designing will continue to be developed. So I'm going to let Cameron go a little more deeply into one of the bubbles, and we'll sort of lap the circle, as it will. Okay, so I hope you've digested your lunch because we're going to do some theories. Uh, okay. Um, as Terry's indicated, I think one of the crucial things that we are trying to say with transition design and the way in which we think it is developing beyond kind of existing sustainable design methodologies is being a lot more self-conscious about the theories of change that are being used in this particular framework. And it really is uh, quite a thoughtful and researched process rather than one that is a lot more pragmatic or technicist. And so that's why I want to kind of run through this uh, with you a little bit. So for example, if you were to consider this uh, matrix, you're looking at research-based methods of change, design-based methods of change, 
and you're either looking at things that are happening cumulatively or incrementally, or you're hoping that there will be some, uh, some radical shift, some disruptive change, some really big step change. And so if you look at this and you said, okay, well, let's just consider sustainable design to date. Sustainable design has normally floated somewhere up in the top two boxes. So the first kind of model is, well, Sustainable design is just about researching. We just need to work out what is the most toxic material. We need to work out what is the most durable material. We need to work out uh, uh, what is the right kind of packaging. We need to work out the most energy efficient. We've just got to work it out. It's just knowledge. It's not really design. It's just knowledge. And once we know it, people will do it. It's the enlightenment model of change. Once people know, they do. And I think we're now in a position in which we've realised that this model is inherently false. So then you get a bunch of designers who come along and say, okay, well, there are lots of barriers to doing what we know we should be doing. There are lots of little barriers, and the job of the designer is not to know all this stuff, leave that to the material scientists and the ecologists. The job of the designer is just to start to make these designs more pleasurable, more efficient, uh, less expensive, sexier, cooler. Like, that's the job of the designer. They've just got to make attractors for this stuff that the scientists have worked out for us. But again, it's a cumulative model of change, that slowly we will be attracted to the greener stuff and then slowly, we're not quite sure how, the whole economy will suddenly just tip over, you know, in some Gladwell fashion, suddenly we'll be uh, all green, it'll be fantastic. And we'll all be having so much fun and pleasure as we go along anyway. And again, I think a slightly uh, a dubious model of change, one that really presumes that humans don't do anything unless it's pleasurable or efficient, and I think we're neither uh, so selfish nor so homo economicus as that. A lot of people then hope that there will be some breakthrough level changes, uh, that in fact what's going to happen is somebody's just going to come up with the new technology that's going to allow a fuel switch and we'll all be on the hydrogen economy. And all you've got to do is combine hydrogen and oxygen and water comes out your tailpipe and it's just going to be fantastic, right? There's going to be this big switch. Don't worry about it. Uh, necessity is the mother of invention. As soon as we run out of stuff, we're just going to make a big change. And again, I think one of the problems with this is that this theory of change really doesn't understand much about the history of innovation, about how long it takes for innovations to roll out, particularly infrastructural changes, and in fact how much social change is required along with any technical change. You can't just suddenly stick a fusion power station in your basement. It will be a very different house, it will be operate in very different ways, you will transport in very different ways, you will eat food in different ways. And so all of those social changes require a lot of thinking that normally people uh, with a techno-fix mentality don't think about. And then finally, you might have uh, a bunch of people who uh, think, okay, well, in fact, what we really need to do is research alternative mindsets. Uh, we just need to start adopting a much more biocentric or biophilic mindsets. And if we all just convinced ourselves of these kinds of religions, then everything else would fall into place. Now, I'm being particularly crude in these characterizations, and I'm being crude to kind of say there are theories of change that have been informing sustainable design to date, uh, but they haven't been very well thought through. And so part of what transition design comes along and says, okay, we really need to be understanding the history of socio-technical change. We really need to understand how these things happen. So let me give you another quick example. If we just looked at social sustainability, for example, you can see that some people would say, okay, the job is just to make you aware of the suffering behind the shoes you're now wearing, and then you will purchase differently. Or my job is to somehow create the app that allows you to find the shoes that have been uh, produced in the least uh, damaging way to other humans. Uh, and that's what I'm just going to make it easier for you. Or in fact, the job is, no, I really need to actually create whole new businesses that the job is actually to do social entrepreneurship, to actually construct very different types of economies. Uh, or finally, okay, well, none of that's going to work. What you've just got to do is spend all your time lobbying the UN and the federal government, because the federal government is a highly functional entity that gets things done. <laughs> okay. Just for example, I think a lot of people are starting to think in this particular way. So I'm not sure if you've seen, but at the Winterhouse Symposium uh, at the end of summer, uh, the, the sort of invitees to that came up with this particular model. Uh, this model uh, has been stress tested on a number of occasions now. It was uh, uh, introduced at the LEAP Symposium a couple of weeks ago at Art Centre in Pasadena. Uh, a number of people involved in it are starting to use it in both teaching. Um, but it's a very interesting example of a type of theory of change in relation to social design. It tries to map different scales and kinds of social design. It tries to say, 
what are the particular capabilities you need at these different levels. And it allows you to begin to evaluate social design projects and say, well, this one's at too big a scale, maybe you should move down. Uh, this one is still too disciplinary, maybe you should move across. This one needs a policy framework in order to begin to function. And this, by the way, is a very important insight into transition design. The transition design is a multi-level mode of change. It requires operating at macro, meso and micro levels simultaneously. Right? It's an extraordinarily complicated thing to do, but it's a recognition that you can't just create something here and hope that it is evolutionarily just going to meme its way through the system. But you also cannot just only work at the macro level. Uh, when the government comes in and says, right, everybody now has to drive uh, only at 15 miles an hour in order to save gas, uh, they can make that policy change, but it only actually takes effect when there are speed humps and speed signs and policemen with cameras actually materialising this practice in a very everyday, localised way. So legislation itself doesn't actually do this. And this is what this theories of change kind of thinking entails. So I don't have so much time to go into these. All I'm trying to do is just highlight for you some of the existing theories primarily outside of design, that we are beginning to enlist within this model of transition design. And they can be mapped in this same uh, matrix framework. So in this kind of cumulative sense, uh, researched cumulative box in the top right, uh, the argument is that in fact a lot of the ecosystem science that we've had to date has been done in an expert manner and the problem is about getting participation of whole populations in trying to work out those risks and how we want to live. And so this is a very different participatory science model. It's a very different way of proceeding. And climate change is, of course, suffering from exactly trying to work out how to negotiate this new type of science, what some people are literally calling a post-normal science. So this would be one example of a type of theory of change, that in fact we need a different way of thinking about knowledge, a different way of thinking about science, not just the enlightenment expert model. We need a participatory one. There's a lot to learn from uh, theories of innovation diffusion, which are very common in design management, understanding that the Segway, for example, was supposed to be a breakthrough in new mobility until it really failed to ever think about the regulatory framework in which it would operate. And so you couldn't ride it on the sidewalk because it was a vehicle and you couldn't ride it on the road because it didn't meet safety standards. And so the only place the Segway uh, now exists is in private roads like airports and large malls and things like that. They're slowly getting licensed uh, for tourists to travel around cities. And the other big problem with the uh, Segway, of course, is that you look like an idiot when you're on it. Uh, and uh, this was another kind of design problem. So here you have a regulatory problem and a design problem that really said that this breakthrough didn't happen because it didn't really understand theories of socio-technical change. These socio-technical practices do kind of break and re-coalesce in whole new ways. And I'll show you a diagram that kind of uh, demonstrates that in a second. And a lot of this is coming out of uh, and here's a horrible piece of jargon for you, Dutch socio-technical niche transition theory, um, which are a bunch of people trying to understand how do we move societies to be decarbonised, how do we move societies to be localised. You actually have to make changes at all these different levels, from what happens at the breakfast table in a, um, a house, uh, all the way up to uh, creating new economies and new mediaries and new providers, up to new regulatory frameworks and infrastructures. And then finally, there are a series of larger discussions going on about whole new ways of thinking about economies, for example. So Paracon is a kind of contraction of participatory economies. They're well demonstrated by things like the sharing economy. And the sharing economy uh, re-embeds economic relations in social interactions, right? Which is a horribly jargonistic way to say the difference between uh, the Hyatt and Airbnb is uh, in the Hyatt I interact with people, but they could effectively be a robot and they sometimes feel a bit robotic. I don't actually get to know them. I don't uh, know anything about them. When I Airbnb, I am transacting with a person. I'm literally having to live with that person. It's a very different type of economy. It's a very different way of understanding economic relations. And so there are lots of frameworks like that to begin to think about. Okay, so transition design out of these theoretical frameworks tends to be multi-level. 
It tends to be very situated in the way that Terry was describing it before. It's always taking heed of where things are at. It doesn't just have a fixed vision that it's ploughing towards in a very modernist way. It is always renegotiating mid-course corrections. Uh, and it is quite transitional. I'm going to talk in particular about the second two. I'll just show you this horrible diagram to say this is the first one, this is multi-level, this is a, a classic kind of image that you get from uh, Dutch policy analysis around how to do socio-technical transition. It just tends to mean that a large level change is disrupted by mid-level systems that uh, are actually themselves disrupted by micro experiments, small niches that suddenly establish themselves. It kind of borrows from ecosystem theory and some of the transitions that happen in ecosystems. But I want to talk in particular about the situated component. Uh, I'm a big fan of Lucy Suchman, of course, one of the great uh, research-led uh, initiatives in relation to human-computer interaction, somebody who really kind of brought design itself and design thinking to software design. And in this very famous book, this is the reissue of the book, the book was originally called the subtitle there, Plans and Situated Actions, uh, Lucy uh, differentiates plans as having a fixed idea of where you want to go from a situated action. And she draws her analogy from this very beautiful quote here that, that I wouldn't mind kind of running through you because I think it really captures what we mean by transition design and what Terry was indicating with that squiggly line to the moon. Gladwin has written a brilliant article contrasting the method of the truckies, how they navigate the sea with the way Europeans navigate. Europeans uh, begin with a plan, a course, which has ch uh, charted according to certain universal principles, and he carries out his voyage by relating his every move to the plan. It's a constantly uh, just, I have to fix the world to fit my plan. By contrast, uh, one could say that the truckies um, encounters, unex uh, sorry, this is, uh, the truckies navigator begins with an objective rather than a plan. I'm looking to become a more sustainable society, though I'm not entirely sure what that looks like. I have clues, I have hints. I have an idea where I want to go, but I don't have a fixed destination. He sets off toward the objective and he responds to the conditions as they arise in an ad hoc fashion. It's not that you can consult the plan as to what you do. You need to remake the plan based on where you are. He utilises information provided by the wind and the waves and the tide, the fawn and the stars, the clouds, the sounds of the water on the side of the board, and he steers accordingly. His effort is directed to doing whatever it is necessary to reach the objective. If asked, he can point to his objective at any moment, but he cannot describe his course. And one of a, a kind of related example uh, are these um, stick maps. I don't know how many people have seen these before. So. Uh, Beautiful uh, example. So to some extent, it, it, it's difficult for a Westerner to get their head around the fact that this is in fact a type of map. It's not a top-down, as it were, uh, God's eye view of a landscape. It's not a, a kind of Google Earth version of a map. It's in fact just a characterization of different wave patterns and currents in the sea. And you literally feel this through the boat as you sail. So at some point you think, where am I? And you, you lower yourself onto the base of the boat and you feel the bouncing and in this way you begin to locate yourself. So it's a very situated type of uh, navigation. And I think this is crucial to understand. Whilst you've got a theory of change, you don't necessarily have a fixed destination or a clear sense of how to get there. It is a very situated movement. And again, this is very different from a lot of sustainable design. If I was to ask a lot of sustainable designers what that future looks like, uh, sometimes they're quite idealistic, sometimes they have no idea. Gideon is going to speak about this. I'll say one last thing on this, which is this might, might sound extraordinarily different to a lot of designing. In a funny way, it bears a lot of resemblance to some of the designing that gave birth to the uh, industrial design profession in particular in the United States. And so this is Norman Belgetti's uh, ridiculous flying wing, an extraordinarily unsustainable vision of the future, uh, one that's actually still being replicated in relation to service design, I just discovered in a previous <laughs> symposium. Um, but nevertheless, here is what was identified by Raymond Lowy very uh, um, uh, famously as Maya, right? This is the most advanced. The job of the designer is to create these speculative propositions in order to soften up the client to what is the ya of Maya, yet acceptable. So if I say we could do this, instead of you thinking we need this, I realise that we could do that. 
It was exactly the same strategy that LG had with the internet refrigerator. You would go into a showroom, there was the internet refrigerator. It was a ridiculous proposition. It cost $1,800, but it made you think that now you might actually buy a $1,000 refrigerator instead of a $500 refrigerator because the $1,000 didn't look so expensive compared to the $1,800 internet fridge, right? It's a, it's a, it's a frequent uh, strategy in marketing and in design visioning. The really important part and the last thing I kind of want to leave you with is to think what it actually means to then present the design, the final design, to the client. If you're a streamliner with this kind of Maya vision, when you present the design to the client, you are not saying this is the be all and end all. Unsustainably, you're saying I'm gonna have to come and replace this later on. There's gonna be model two, there's gonna be model three. I'm gonna keep going through different iterations, right? iPhone two, iPhone three, iPhone four. But what I'm saying is, this is merely helping us move in a new direction. This is a design that is not merely meeting current needs. This is a design that is allowing us to adopt new types of practices and infrastructures and expectations. This is a situated navigation of what it is that we currently have. And I think transition design is really about that. But to actually capture this sense of, okay, so what is the objective? Uh, Gideon's gonna talk to you a bit. I'll leave you in a sense with this example, which is to say, this is another example of a transition design. Right? It's a violently ugly and not particularly functional bicycle, if you've ever read one. Uh, but it has caused enormous and extraordinarily radical shifts in the whole of Manhattan overnight. Opposition to bike lanes, ways in which people drive, people's understanding of distance, the whole of their kind of lived geography of Manhattan has changed because of this kind of situated uh, transitional design. So I think this is a better example than uh, Raymond Lowy's. Um, hello, everybody. Um, so the thing about designers design is that they visualize and envision alternative uh, scenarios, solutions to problems. But, um, and, but they're not usually directed at um, envisioning alternative lifestyles. They're usually directed at um, propping up current lifestyles, um, perpetuating current lifestyles. Um, and so what we're saying about um, transition design is that it's, um, we need to uh, use design skills to begin to develop narratives and scenarios about alternative, more satisfactory li lifestyles, about how we might live in, in the future and how, about how we can begin to live now. And if we think about it, almost everything about our current lifestyle are typically unsatisfactory. For example, um, how business is organized, how politics is organized, um, how we eat, how we clothe, how we build, um, uh, how we educate ourselves. Um, really, there's very little um, about our current lifestyles that isn't open to, for criticism and at the same time, even though it's not very satisfactory, um, it consume, our lifestyles consume enormous amounts of finite resources and uh, trash the planetary ecosystems in the process. So what we're saying is that there's a tremendous, exciting potential for designers to become visionary advocates for a new kind of society um, to offer critiques of existing lifestyles to champion alternatives. And having this vision is important because it can inform, as Terry suggested, it can inform current initiatives and solutions and inspire us to conceive solutions that we, hadn't, we wouldn't otherwise have thought of. And those solutions in turn feed back and help evolve the long-term vision. Um, so, the unique challenge of transition design, I think, is to bring together the necessary and the desirable. 
that is to address problems of climate change and poverty and ill health and loss of biodiversity, toxic waste, the demise of community and so on in a way that improves or optimizes our quality of life rather than making it more difficult than it already is. Um, this, this particular illustration is from a book published, I think, in the 70s, mid-70s, called Radical Technology, which was um, done by the founders of the Alternative Technology Center, Center for Alternative Technology in Wales. Um, it looks a bit of its era, but many of the ideas um, and solutions that they were um, playing with at that time are still remarkably um, relevant. Um, so transition design isn't simply about surviving the future. We have a far better chance of transitioning to a sustainable society um, if the future is a place that we can be happier, healthier, uh, more convivial, more fulfilled, and, and less burdened, exploited, indebted, isolated, uh, stressed, and, and generally oppressed. So transition design makes the future desirable. It's somewhere we want to be uh, rather than somewhere we dread being. Um, these are a series of uh, images from um, an exhibition, what well, began as an exhibition and was made into a book by Ezio Mancini and Francoise Jeju called uh, Sustainable Everyday Lives. So um, the whole book is uh, various forms of visualization of possible future urban scenarios. Uh, um, interestingly, I think it was probably done about 10 years ago, but a lot of the things that they were suggesting are now becoming um, not, not uncommon. So, um, uh, Terry mentioned briefly the not yet. Um, and this is, a, this is a concept that comes from um, um, early and mid 20th century German philosopher called Ernst Bloch, who was, um, uh, he was a utopian Marxist philosopher, um, but he, um, he, he was very clear on the fact that you can't, um, it, it, we can't hope to envision future societies um, as blueprints. We can't hope to blueprint them. We can't see them. We can't fix them in our mind's eye and then head towards them. Um, we have to have a much more uh, fluid, flexible, open-ended, evolving um, uh, idea about what the future is. We have an idea that it's somewhere in which the um, alienated relationships between people and between people and nature um, are somehow addressed, but we, we don't know terribly much more than that. And, but what we do know, we can, what we can do if we're sensitive to it is we can see intimations of that present in the current state of things, in the now. Um, and he called that the not yet. So the not yet represents uh, potentials that exist in the present um, that may or may not be realized. And those, the, that is the potential for a much more desirable society. So what we're saying is that tran as transition designers, we must be sensitive to the present of the not yet in our everyday lives. So the particular vision that we've been um, talking about, um, well, well, what, what is it we're loosely proposing? Um, we begin from, from this basic criticism of our current society. Our, transit, our current infrastructure is based upon centralized control and ownership of resources, food production and distribution, energy generation, manufacturing, really everything you can think of on which our lives depend. And, um, and our centralized governments and uh, tends to concentrate power in tiny, self-interested elites who ignore or don't understand the needs of communities and ecosystems in which they're situated, and in the process, degrading both the social and ecological fabric. So 
a great deal of activism. Um, you wouldn't know it by you know, reading the mainstream media or news, looking at the news, but a great deal of activism focuses on the need for the kinds to, to address the kinds of problems that um, I've been talking about by localizing, localizing food production, localizing currency, um, financial systems, localizing business activities, localizing energy conservation, um, uh, localizing restoring ecosystems, and so on and so on, um, which is um, something that I think I think um, is is absolutely necessary. Um, we need. In many respects, we need to radically uh, localize our society and, uh, and decentralize um, it in many different ways. So, but on the other hand, um, this simple localism, which is often the position of uh, grassroots green activists, um, is not in itself, in and of itself, enough. It's not, it's not adequate to um, address um, the kinds of problems that we're talking about. It's, it's, it's necessary, but it's not adequate. So, what we're saying is that we need to, um, to, to develop a planetary, um, or if you like, a cosmopolitan approach to transition, not just a localist approach. And that's for, several, for various reasons. Um, firstly, social and ecological problems don't simply impact the locality in which they um, occur. Local problems rapidly become planetary. And there's a very egregious example of this at the moment with Fukushima, which is, it still may cause um, planetary um, disaster, um, and yet, it's being entirely addressed by uh, a fairly incompetent um, nuclear energy company in Japan and uh, a, a government who's very embarrassed about having this problem in the first place. But it's, a, it's really a problem that the planet needs to deal with that, that collectively, very urgently. It, um, and most problems are of that nature. Um, so the second reason that we need to think more broadly than locally, simply locally, is that um, certain aspects of the new alternative lifestyles that we're talking about, um, they have to be designed at a larger or higher level of scale than the local. So if we're thinking about, say, uh, a transport system for the continent of North America, that r requires you know, a, a large amount of cooperation between um, many different places or um, so there are many examples of those kinds of systems which simply can't be established at the local level um, the third reason is um, the many of the lo kinds of local initiatives that um, I've been talking about um, that the localists are talking about will benefit from the knowledge, technology, and skills shared with other communities who are engaged in similar activities in other places. So there, there is a need to share knowledge and skills across the planet about how to live locally. Um, and the final reason is that um, we're not talking, at least I'm not talking, about a future in which um, you know, we have these self-contained, isolated, uh, self-sufficient communities. There is a still some level of exchange going on between communities. Um, each, each community or each will specialize in certain activities and that will necessi necessitate some sort of networked exchange between different places. Um, so we're calling this integration of the global perspective and place-based lifestyle um, cosmopolitan localism. Um, and that, that is a term that was first, to my knowledge, first used maybe 20 or 30 years ago by Gary Snyder, the poet. Um, and he said, we seek the balance between cosmopolitanism and deep local consciousness. 
we're asking how the whole human race can regain self-determination in place after centuries of having been disenfranchised by hierarchy and or centralized power. Uh, more recently, Ezio Mancini, a designer, has written, the local is not local, but it is or can be a locally based cosmopolitan community. In this conceptual and practical framework, the multi-local society appears as a society based on communities and places that are at the same time strong in their own identity, embedded in a physical place, and open and connected to other places and communities. Yeah. So, so um, these, uh, this is a representation of the relationship between the local um, and the global or the cosmopolitan. And you can see what we're envisioning is that um, when we talk, the local is household neighbor, would probably loosely be defined as household neighborhood, city and region. And um, the vision is that those exist in a, in a nested and networked way. So you have multiple households within a neighborhood, neighborhoods within cities, cities within region and so on. And, um, and understanding that basic structure, which is similar to the structure of living systems such as ecosystems, um, is key to designing within them. So um, there's a creative network relationship between the local um, and the planetary, um, and local or regional communities are seen as belonging to the larger community that comprises the planet as a whole. Um, Cosmopolitan localists and transition designers as agents of cosmopolitan localism work to create a global network of sustainable and mutually supporting place-based communities. Okay, so this is a, a very um, tentative vision, a personal vision um, of Transitionville in 2040. Um, citizens share skill, ideas, knowledge, technologies, resources, and culture with other communities all over the place, but at the same time, everyday life remains place-based. And I'm going to uh, paint a few uh, scenarios about the kinds of uh, uh, the, the form, if you like, everyday life takes. Um, and as I, as I said, this is just... Um, uh, I'm just painting a picture, um, although the picture is in words because the, there aren't images of it yet. And as designers, you, you, uh, your profession is to, you know, visualize, and so you're better at that than, you know, I might be. So, um, citizens in transition fields, if they work for large organizations, work is undertaken through a combination of online, online collaboration with co-workers who do not live in the area and peri periodic face-to-face -face collaboration with those who do. The need to spend large parts of the day traveling to work and earning money to finance the commute has been eliminated. Many needs can now be directly met in ways that restore the social and ecological fabric of the local community. Because needs are met in integrated ways at the local level through network structures, profiteering middlemen, anonymous bureaucracies, and unaccountable corporations are a thing of the past. Transitionville's dependence on products imported from great distances, created by people working in exploitative conditions, is eliminated, along with negative ecological impacts. Neighborhood streets have become places where people meet and enjoy each other's company. Fences have been removed between private yards, creating massive open space for play, growing food and parties. Indigenous flora and fauna return to these green spaces, and cars and other vehicles are greatly reduced in number and are collectively owned by the neighborhood. Food is grown in gardens by individuals collectively in the neighborhood, uh, community gardens, and on farms surrounding the city. It is then distributed to households, and much cooking is undertaken collectively in the neighborhood kitchen, which is also a daycare center. Childcare centers are run by the elderly and retired. Children are taught in local schools and take an active role in the upkeep of their neighborhood. Clothes are washed in the neighborhood-owned laundry, which combines a library, cinema, cafe, and performance space. Many small businesses and co-ops that serve the city are owned and run from within households. 
but many have retail outlets and shared office space in the surrounding neighborhoods. Clusters of neighborhoods collaborate to create market squares um, in which businesses and farmers uh, sell their products. The squares are used as gathering spaces where local issues are debated and resolved, where performances and seasonal celebrations are held. Energy is generated from wind, sun, and other renewable sources and distributed with throughout the cities through microgrids owned by neighborhood cooperatives. So, in short, this is a low consumption, intelligently designed, high quality lifestyle in which onerous and exploitative employment has been eliminated. People have much more free time to spend with relatives and friends in creative activities, community improvement projects, and in nature. So in today's lifestyle, these activities are marginalized, but in a sustainable society, they take center stage. In other words, the necessary has become desirable. So coming back to Terry's diagram, when I was thinking about that, this, I was quite struck by how many of those kind of ideas already are already in place. Um, some of them have actually become quite widespread in certain parts of the world. Um, um, some of them have been, have been actually very um, highly developed, really, already. So, it, but it's really a question, it's, a, it's almost, uh, it's a question of how, as Terry said, how we amplify them, how we connect them, integrate them together, how we um, make them more robust, and how we relate them to the vision of the future des desired state. And um, that's how we can uh, begin to elicit the not yet. <coughs> so I'm going to hand you over to Terry, who's going to talk about um, the mindset and the posture necessary for this. Thanks. So we have. We've got one more tiny little piece, and then we can open it up for a discussion, hopefully, and we have a little takeaway that we made for those of you that might be interested in resources and other places to look. So I hope, I hope it's becoming apparent what we're doing. We're saying there are four areas that need to be um, created and worked within to be effective transition designers. We have to have the vision. We have to understand something about how change happens and how we can direct it. And now I'm going to talk about the kind of body we need to get there. And then I think together we will be developing new ways of designing that come out of that. So what happened there? So mindset and posture reflect our way of being in the world. Think of it as our attitude and the spirit which we bring to collaboration and designing with other people. We argue that transition design will challenge us to intentionally take up new postures and mindsets in order to transition towards that not yet. So we think it's going to involve shifting our values. I mean. What's it going to be like to say, oh, I must, I probably need to reflect upon my values and perhaps shift them intentionally, developing a more holistic and ecological worldview and value set, embracing transdisciplinarity and collaboration. I think designers do this naturally, but I think transdisciplinarity, if you're, if you're collaborating with somebody from a really different discipline, you have to drop your jargon. You have to drop your certainty. You have to constitute new ways of working and vocabularies together. I mean, I found that out when I was trying to teach design to scientists. I had to completely take up a different posture because you're, you're interacting with people that know way more than you do about a whole domain. It, it requires humility, I think. The ability to design within and for uncertainty, ambiguity, chaos, and contradiction. I mean, our society favors certainty to such a degree. Ex you are rewarded for being an expert. All of us in this room are experts. And so what is it going to feel like to step out of that posture for a good portion of the time? And as we said before, this committed sense of urgency, you know, not to be espousing gloom and doom, but to be optimistic that we can change things. So what led us to this is our own grappling towards a larger framework 
within which to teach design within which to research different areas of design but also within which to practice design in a more focused way so i've used this example before in some lectures i mean to me the one on the left sort of embodies the dominant paradigm based on certainty excuse me where is the one on the right kind of reflects this posture of curiosity and wonder and a sense that you are part of a greater whole instead of uh, in domination over it. So the posture of speculation and holistic thinking that's re represented by this, I think, the qualitative attributes of context are seen as integral. Outcomes can't be predicted but are rather emergent properties of a system that is interconnected and interdependent. Solutions are place-based and best undertaken by teams of transdisciplinary problem solvers. Solutions are iterative and evolve over time. Problems are best solved from a posture of speculation. And I know from having been part of a big company and running my own that clients often want you to be certain. They want you to come in as an expert, say this is exactly what you should do. So it's going to require all of us taking up sort of confident postures of speculation. And I've talked about this one too. When you're bent over in the posture of an expert, well, it's like the, the blind monks trying to figure out the el what the elephant is. <coughs> one says, oh no, it's a snake. Another says, oh no, it's a big you know, leg. So we have to raise up out of this posture in order to develop vocabularies for collaboration. And I think creating spaces of permission to not know everything. We've all been in situations where you don't really say what you think because you're afraid you're going to get denigrated for not knowing. What do you mean you don't know? So, so if you start at the level of typography and letter spacing, by the time you've raised up into this posture, you're actually saying, what is the message? Or moreover, well, what's the point of the message? So how can we develop the fluidity of posture to toggle between those two? So the shifting values are sort of characterized here. It's a shift from control through hierarchy and domination to an emphasis on relationships of interconnection, reciprocity and interdependency, from competition to cooperation, from a view that nature exists to serve humans, to an appreciation and respect for all life forms, to a belief that outcomes can be predicted, to a belief that outcomes are unpredictable and an emergent property, the belief that problems can all be solved through intellect versus the acknowledgement that ignorance is sort of part of the human condition, the a belief that the power of science and technology is unlimited to a belief that there are limits. Viable, um, I mean possible doesn't always equal viable. Values quantity over quality. Unlimited growth is not only possible but it's viable versus having a deep understanding of the power of limits. We are on a finite planet and yet we do not design and behave as if we were. I mean, it's famously said that if everybody in the West was living, everyone in the world was living the way we do in the West right now, it would take five planet Earths to fulfill everybody's needs. So shifting from a lack of concern for future generations to an ability to think and design for very long horizons of time. And near and dear to my heart, shifting from educational models in which students master the same facts as the teachers, to an education through a model of co-learning and reskilling. I mean, I frequently say to my students when I talk about these kinds of issues, I don't have the answers. I can tell you what I think my generation didn't do very well, and I can share the questions I'm asking with you, and I'm a really good student myself. So we have to sort of enter into this space of co-learning, and I can teach you how to learn, and I'll definitely qualify when I'm telling you something I'm really, really sure of, but there's a whole area over here that we have to step into together and co-learn. So some of the characteristics of this posture, I think, are absolute collaboration. It will be essential in the transition to a sustainable society. 
And I think of true collaboration as a dance, and your dance card should always be full. Some of you young people may not know what a dance card is, but Google it. <laughs> um, <laughs> curiosity implies it, a commitment to lifelong co-learning, stepping back from the need to be an expert. It's really liberating when one does that in all situations and areas. So it's harnessing the power of beginner's mind. Have, have any of you read that book? Amazing book, just the amazing quality. It's, a, it's stepping into that phenomenological space of beginner's mind where you see things that you don't see in your habitual way of, of knowing. Speculation, an acknowledgement that we often don't know what we don't know. The permission to not be an expert, it invites other points of view with a readiness to change one's mind especially important when designing for chaos and complexity. And humility, acknowledgement that ignorance is not a solvable problem, it is rather an inescapable part of the human condition. We will always know less than more about most things. And respect for other, the acknowledgement of the intrinsic worth of other, other cultures, other individuals, and other species and the planet itself, a commitment to fostering symbiotic, respectful, restorative relationships through design and interactions. And authenticity, a commitment to truthfulness in our designs and all of our interactions. And that optimistic grumpiness that Cameron's talking about, a committed sense of urgency in the need for change and an unwillingness to accept the status quo combined with optimism about the possibility of the transition to a sustainable future. So there's, there's a transition framework that we are proposing and we are very excited about it and we have actually introduced it in our new curriculum at Carnegie Mellon which launches in the fall as one of three sort of nested research areas. So one of the things we're very excited about is not only will that run throughout the undergrad, grad, and doctoral levels, but we'll be launching, relaunching our own PhD and offering a professional doctorate in the fall, and we're hoping that our PhD students will especially focus on this. So we've just put uh, a wiki page up on it, and like I said, we're tossing it out there uh, in hopes that it's a space, we want to invite other people into the space, other educators, other practitioners. We're going to be begin publishing papers on it and we'd love to foster a bigger conversation. We think it's really important to pull design conversations up and out of the dominant economic paradigm and commerce model. Not to say we shouldn't be working there, we must, but to say what if we pull up above that and say commerce and the economy ought to exist in order to serve lifestyle-based needs, the satisfaction of lifestyle-based needs. So what we've got for you today is again a little sketch that lays out our argument and that there's the framework itself. There's the premise. And we've got some resources and um, websites at the bottom that we found that we find very helpful and useful when thinking about this model. So with that, I'd like to open it up to discussion or questions. Um, thank you.